Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Charles Green. Charlie and I met probably over 10 years ago when we had breakfast in New York on the Upper East Side. I am a big fan of his work, of his book, The Trusted Advisor. Charlie has been a hugely influential voice in the professional services world, but far beyond that as well, because the pursuit of creating trust with clients has never been more critical than it has been right now. Charlie is the author of a few different books, including The Trusted Advisor Field Book, Trust-Based Selling, and his original version of Trusted Advisor, which came out in 2000, but is still relevant and has been re-edited today for the modern world. Today, we talk about how to build trust with employees, with colleagues, with clients. We talk about generational differences, and we talk about why age-old ethics has never been more critical than it is right now and how you can bring that to work every day for yourself. Please enjoy Charles Green. Charles, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. It's so good to see you. And Likewise. it's been a while. <laughs> yes. We had breakfast like probably 12 years ago at this point in New York City. At least. Yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. But do you remember what you ate? <laughs> no, but I can tell you it was on one of the north-south avenues and we were on the east side and it was probably brunch. And I think it was yeah. spring or fall. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I know I had no kids because my husband and I were traveling together and we had time to do like sightseeing on a work trip. Right. I don't know. I actually do. I think we were there for like a blog world conference or something. Wow. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so nice to meet you and to see. Well, it's so nice to see you again. And I think sure. your work has never been more relevant than what's happening right now in a post-COVID mm -hmm. world, there's just a lot of bad vibes out there when we think about yeah. my audience and customer service and experience. Um, let's just let's just get a gauge. Let's just start here with what is happening in the world with regard to this idea of trust? What's happening in the world when we think about trust right now? Well, wow, that's a big one. Um, let's see, where do we dive into that? I, a couple of thoughts. One, I think compared to maybe 10 years ago, when you see the word trust in the business press and so forth, it's more likely now to be talking about institutional trust than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, when it was at least as likely to be personal trust. So when we wrote the book, The Trusted Advisor, that was aimed very much at interpersonal trust, the relationships that one has with one's clients, you know, employees, et cetera. And now you see an awful lot about, you know, the failures of institutional trust, trust in Congress is down, trust in media is down, trust in you name it is down, all of which is true. But um, I, I think the debate has suffered because people tend to think that you can act directly on institutional trust, you know, affected from the outside. And one of my strong beliefs is you can't. It's much better to work on it from the inside. So instead of viewing it as a social phenomenon, something to be you know measured in broad terms i think it's basically a psychological phenomenon between two individuals um, it makes sense grammatically to say i trust amazon but i don't trust the amazon driver to babysit my kid oh uh, interesting. you know it's, uh, uh, it's interesting too in, in the 2020 elections here in the u.s um, <clears throat> institutional trust for the house of representatives is among the lowest in government something like 20 30 percent and yet the rate of incumbency reelection is about 96%. So people are basically saying, yeah, I don't trust any of those people. Well, actually my guy, my gal, her or him, I trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an inherent power of, of um, and I think that has implications, which maybe we can get into for how do you improve, you know, trust in an organization. But so that's, that's one thing happening. Um, the other one is I think it's down, you know, and I think that, uh, COVID, as you mentioned, had a lot to do with that. Technology has a lot to do with it. Zoom has a lot to do with it. But I'm, I'm a little more sanguine about that. I don't think it has to be that way. I think it's uh, possible for us all to get a lot better at Zoom technology, and, and we don't have to give up on some of the things that we think we do. So there's right. a couple of thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand, you know, even my own clients complain that they're – 
their um, employees don't want to come into the office. They like Zoom. They like and and while I say, oh, you know, well, I think yes, in person collaboration is always better. Even you know, when you go to conferences, it's nice to meet people in person. It's much Absolutely. more impactful. However. I personally, I wouldn't want to give up the ability to be there when my kids get home from school or exercise right. and all of the beautiful things about not having to commute. So then right. I wouldn't want to take that from someone else. So it's like right now we're just living at a time where people are just trying to hold on to the things that make them feel good while also right. showing up at work. And it's just this, it's a, it's a strange time because the habits we formed during COVID are still lingering. Very true. And we're still all sorting it out. There's a, there's a generational thing, too. I notice, for example, I, I do some ongoing work with one of the big four accounting firms and uh, typical audience, I don't know, maybe 30, 35. And despite all my best efforts at shaming them, encouraging them, only about half people come on camera. Oh, by contrast, okay. I've done some stuff Saturday mornings with an undergraduate audience age 20 or so. Every single one of them is on camera. They may be in pajamas, having coffee, a bowl of cereal, but they're on camera for, you know, they, they don't have a discomfort that a slightly older generation does. Right. So there's that working too. That's amazing to me because I, you know, my generation, you know, you would think millennials don't care what people think as much, but like, I still very much feel the pressure to, you know, when I'm on camera, like look camera ready. So a, a lot of our leaders that are listening are grappling with employees that just don't want to do what their leaders want them to do. I mean, you see this in the news, like with so many leaders saying, come into the office. If you don't right. come into the office or move near the office, then you're fired. At the same time, industries that are having trouble um, attracting and retaining talent, they realize they can't force their employees to come to the office. And we were chatting before we started the podcast about this idea of culture. So, I mean, what are some of the things that you think companies with strong cultures can be doing right now to do something to engage and retain employees, even when they can't do everything they want to? Yeah. I, well, let's start with just underscoring what you said. You can't force anybody to do anything at, at, at almost any level. I mean, really. So the question is not, you know, how do you make your commands and, and more forceful? It's how do you create incentives that make people naturally want to do things? And, and you know, we probably need to sort of, we're not at the end of sorting out how much is in-house and how much is work from home and so forth. That'll, that'll end up balancing. But I think, um, you need to make a culture that uh, appreciates, um, that gives people value for interacting with, with each other interpersonally on occasion. And, uh, you know, how do you make those positive? I, I think you, you lean into it. You, you, uh, you, you set your office environments in a way that's different than we did a long time ago. You know, the, 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 um, uh, you want to encourage collaboration. You want to make it fun. Uh, all the reasons that people like, you know, we need to double down on those. I, I, and I think that, uh, you know, as we both said, there is value to being in person and there is value to being on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And we need to get sharper about what each of those are. I mean, I think if, if companies said you should use Zoom and you should work at home for the following kinds of situations, we encourage you to do that. At the same time, let's all recognize there are these situations, these values where it really helps to be together. I don't have a super coherent answer to that question, Blake. It's uh, that's okay. It is a cultural issue to some extent, but let's talk okay. about virtues and values um, that we were <laughs> right. chatting about earlier. Um, virtues yeah. you mentioned are more personal, it's credibility, reliability. Values are institutional. Can you just dive into these two concepts for my audience? Yeah, just to set that up, um, I think if two, when we talk about trust, uh, two simple ideas to keep in mind. One, we've already mentioned the difference between personal and institutional trust. And the other one is the nature of trust. Trust is a result of an interaction between two parties. There's a trustor and a trustee. One trusts the other, one is trusted. And the key variables there are trusting, which is risk taking and trustworthiness. And we have this thing in the book, The Trusted Advisor, called the trust equation, uh, which is probably the most popular part of the book. That has to do with trustworthiness. We don't have a similar model for trusting, but it's, it's basically risk-taking. So I think of the virtues as those four components that we uh, align in the trust equation, trustworthiness, credible, reliable, intimate, 
all divided by self-orientation. So those are things that we, we use the word virtue on purpose, partly because it goes with values, the two Vs, the whatever that word is for words that sound alike, have a ring together. Uh, those are at the personal level. At the institutional level, um, we developed a set of four values, and they're not unique. Anybody can come up with their own. The four that we came up with are uh, a positive attitude toward, towards collaboration, always be on the same side of the table as the other person, long-term relationship focus, not short-term transactional focus, a habit of transparency in all cases, except when it's uh, hurtful or illegal, um, and, and then finally, a focus on the other for the sake of the other, not for the sake of yourself. Uh, so in, in the field of sales, for example, uh, customer focus is a good thing, but not if you're just using customer focus to make more money for yourself. That's the customer focus of a vulture. And uh, so anyway, those four kind of values married up with personal virtues. And the roles of leaders are to champion both of those. Number one, by role modeling personally what it looks like to be a virtuous person, a highly trustworthy person. And number two, to actively promote the institutional values, uh, whether you use the four that I mentioned or, or something else. So I think a, a good leader has to, you know, lean into risky situations. They have to be willing to uh, articulate uh, moments, seize the moments when, when an issue of, do um, uh, you have time for a quick vignette? Absolutely. I was um, working for Accenture at one point and I was invited to give a talk to some global top 40 execs gathering. I, I was following the CEO. They didn't let me in the room during the CEO speech, but let me in for the end of it. His name was Bill Green, no relationship to me. And somebody asked him a question, something like, I guess it had been a new reorganization rollout. And somebody said, hey, Bill, have you yet put into place all the uh, incentives for uh, uh, collaboration that you've just talked about here? So that when my friend from Australia over here calls me, I'm incented to support him and so forth. And Bill Green got visibly upset, got up out of his chair, went to the front of the stage and pointed at the guy and he said, I never want to hear that question again from anybody in this room. If there's ever a doubt between doing the right thing and following the incentives, you do the right thing first and fix the incentives later. Am I clear? And, you know, 40 people got pretty clear. And I thought that was just a lovely example of leadership. He picked a, a critical value, doing the right thing. He chose a dramatic moment for it, and he leaned into it. He made a lot of, milked a lot of drama out of that moment. Uh, and that, to me, is what a good leader does. They role model the virtues, and they, um, you know, promote the values. Okay, Charlie, so let's talk more about generational um, requests and generational tastes. Do the younger generations prefer things differently in an organization as far as trust is concerned um, in contrast to like the baby boomer generation or Gen X? Well, a lot of people know more about that than I do, but I'll point to a couple of things. Um, one, I think uh, younger people are much more um, adept at fluid, surface, um, easygoing, non-consequential interactions. And um, I mean, years ago, there was a study by some psychologists who pointed out the difference between cultures that, that foster neuro neurotic behavior versus psychotic behavior. And he, he contrasted, um, you know, life on the prairie in 1880 in Minnesota. And you'd maybe have some, you know, family of farmers and, and suddenly you wake up one day and, and uh, the guy's going nuts, killed his wife, shot the kids and hung himself. That's psychosis. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> scary. And everybody says, I never would have thought. Who would have thought? By contrast, you look at children who grew up on Israeli kibbutzim, and it's totally communal. And, uh, you know, it's a rough, it's a stretched analogy. But basically, people who are 20, 21 now are much more adept at ongoing surface interactions. Things don't upset them that they might have from your or my generation. On the other hand, the downside of that is you lack all the deep interpersonal, you know, uh, strong moments of change and impact that we get from interacting with people. And I do find that, that younger generations, they, they're risk averse, emotionally risk averse and uh, you know, much too given to instant gratification and surface, you know, likes and dislikes. Smarter people than me have spoken very well about the impact of social media. Jonathan Haidt comes to mind, 
the coddling of the American mind. And he's largely right. I mean, we're creating people that are adept at trivial interactions and in, inept when it comes to deep, meaningful human connections. So mm -hmm. I'm hardly the first one to say that, but I do see that. Right. In your book, Trusted Advisor, there's a lot of discussion about how to create more meaningful interactions. And you really learn about the power of communication and words. What are some of the ways that you've seen firms in a B2B organization just thrive and excel in creating a culture that trust is very easy to create with customers? Yeah. Um... I have seen, I haven't seen any really big organizations who do it great across the board. I've seen some smaller ones who are great across the board, but I've seen a lot of pieces of big companies. Ernst & Young has a chunk. Microsoft has a chunk. I'm talking organizations of, you know, 10 to 500 people who do remarkable things by fostering a culture of trust. And in a way, it's pretty simple. Like we said before, you know, they figure out what some values are, make sure that they live them, that they role model them, and they promote some values. And if you do that, you get things. I remember the guy at Microsoft was telling me uh, his organization, um, and Microsoft is a, is a metrics crazy organization, and he was outperforming on all these metrics, low turnover, great, you know, uh, employee satisfaction, all, all these things. And, and the top leadership came and said, what are you doing? And he said, trust. And they said, no, really, what are you doing? <laughs> they couldn't believe it. But you know, if, if you're in an environment where people trust you and you feel comfortable trusting them across a variety of topics and you don't feel emotionally at risk, you feel safe, I mean, those are the people you want to hang out with. There was a study, uh, Google did a big study eight, ten years ago on uh, what makes the most effective teams. And they did the classic Google study. This was called Project Aristotle. And uh, they, they, you know, crunched all the numbers like only Google could do. And they came up with a very simple answer, emotional safety, that you want to feel secure and safe with the people you're hanging out with. Mm -hmm. uh, as one person said, you know, I spend most of my living hours at work. Most of my life is at work. And if I don't feel that way about the people I'm hanging with, then I'm not really living, am I? And you know, she had a point. So, yeah, emotional safety. You know, emotional safety, you know, now we're in a time where there's just much more conversation about mental health. And I think that can be good for me and bad because sometimes it's not clear what you can say, how you should act at work versus what you shouldn't say or can't say. And, you know, some say that maybe we're in a hypersensitive society. Yeah. Um, but I think obviously there's been a light shown on some real uh, bruises that you know we needed to talk about but like what's the balance for organizations when you have to be able to do the job and communicate with people at the same time you do need to be careful because you can hurt people yeah I, I think the um, uh, my take on that is there's almost nothing you can't say if you say it with enough respect and care mm -hmm. genuine care about the other person Mm -hmm. um, you can get, I mean, it's not the words you can, you can say the most outrageous, like, you know, with, even with a dog, it's your tone of voice, not the words that people react to or the dog react to. And, and I think it's the same, the same with people. So there are certain phrases. If you want to say something risky, I suggest you start off by at the risk of, mm -hmm. and then you name the thing that's risky at the risk of me looking stupid, at the risk of offending you, at the risk of asking an overly personal question. Because then you've essentially said, I apologize in advance if this may be off, mm -hmm. uh, but may I ask this anyway? And th that gives the person the right to say, no, I don't want to ask that, or don't worry about it, of course, blah, blah, blah. So if you approach all interactions with you know, respect and care, uh, you don't find the answer in, in putting up boundaries about this topic is out of bounds. So one thing I'm really interested in about you is that like reading your book, a lot of it is just like how to be a good person. And yeah, I, I, know you, I know you've had a colorful childhood. You, you, you drove a taxi in New York. That's shocking. Um, what <laughs> made you like this? What made you interested in, in this idea of trust? And how did you, how did you know all of these ideas? Um, good question. Some of it came about um, because I went into... I went to business school and then I went into management consulting and 
20 years of management consulting, you end up with a lot of war stories, you make a lot of mistakes, and on, on reflection, looking backward, and this is from my two co-authors as well, we thought, boy, there's you know a lot going on here, and gee, an awful lot of it has to do with trust, and we got enamored of this term, the trusted advisor which was already in, in play. We couldn't copyright it by the time we wrote the book 20 years ago. It was already pretty common. So that, that was part of it. Um, and the other part was, I think, just your garden variety um, midlife crisis. Um, I, I joined um, uh, a 12-step program, quit drinking 28 years ago. I haven't had a drink in 28 years. And if you know anything about the 12-step stuff that originated with Alcoholics Anonymous, it's very much uh, as they say, the, only the first step is about drinking. The other 11 are about fixing you so you don't do the things that you did in the first place to drink. So it's about becoming, as you said, a better person. And it turns out there's an awful lot of overlap with that and trust. Oh, one other thing, too. The, um, I was a philosophy major undergraduate. And if you go back and look at some of the Greek Stoic philosophers, they have a lot in common with this, too. Things like um, it, it doesn't... If you're upset, maybe it's because somebody did something wrong, but there's definitely something wrong with you because pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. That's on you. Or, um, you know, Susie may be annoying, but that's not the point. The point is, are you or are you not annoyed? The only thing you can do is work on your annoyance, not on the other person's annoyingness. So these all care, they have their correlates within, within trust. It is take responsibility for what's yours, be respectful to other people, listen more than you talk, be genuinely curious. Uh, I mean, these are, you know, most basic religions deal with some of the same stuff. Um, anyway, I, I think you're absolutely right to point out that, you know, getting good at trust is very similar to being a good person. That's a lifelong approach but you know we learned the basics in kindergarten we've forgotten them through higher education and, and uh, an overwhelming sense of metrics and the internet and so forth but it's still pretty basic stuff yeah i think becoming self-aware and i mean for me i've been interested in stoicism for a long time yeah. not in, a, in an intense way just in a like listening to more podcasts about it and um just thinking about this idea that mind over matter, if you don't mind, then it doesn't matter. So even if somebody <laughs> is being emotional or, you know, irrational, I didn't make that up, but you know, it doesn't matter as long as you can delay a, a, a fiery response and you can stay calm, then exactly. and then you win the argument, actually, if you can stay yeah. stoic. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I believe, uh, you know, Ryan Holiday has a podcast called, I think, Daily Stoic. And he's very into Marcus Aurelius. Oh, really? The author of, I don't know what the book yeah. is called, but about Stoicism. So, um, so let's I write that down. That's, that's fascinating. I'm going to send I'm you a podcast I listened to on the airplane yesterday from Vegas about, actually had Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has a new book out called Be Useful, which I yes. think you like. But, you know, I like talking to people that have been through a lot in their life and just have this why, this wisdom, because there's just so much stress and noise and it's yeah. hard to sometimes show up at work and be, you know, a good person and not bring your baggage to work. But I think one right. of the things the world needs, one of the things the world needs is just better leaders, better coaches, more stoics, stronger people right now. And that's hard to find and hard to develop. Yeah, it is. And, and I totally agree with you. More than ever, we need that kind of person now. And we, we, we can all strive to become directionally, move in that, in that sort of direction. And we should. Yeah, and I, I would like to see more organizations have programs where older people mentor younger people. Because yeah. even as I get older, and I'm not that old, like, I think right. some of these lessons that I've learned, I would have loved to have someone like this to teach me yeah. when I was 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah, some, I, I agree. I mean, same thing. If I had, you know, when, when we wrote the book, we said, well, let's write down all the mistakes we made so that other people don't have to make them again. Well, unfortunately, we all have to make our own mistakes, but, you know, uh, hopefully you learn from them. And, and I know if, if I'd read that book, you know, 40 years before, it would have saved me a few. Yeah, I mean, the book is just so valuable still. And I know you did a new edition of The Trust Advisor, but just how to communicate, how to be with your clients, how to be with your colleagues, how to be fair. 
Um, just, you know, some of it is like basic lessons, but we all need to be reminded all the time. And there's just a lot of value in the book. Let's switch yeah. gears and just get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. Are you ready sure. for some fun rapid fire? Sure. Go for it. All right, Charlie. Number one, what is the most important part of your morning routine? <laughs> uh, I get up early, do Wordle and Spelling Bee, and then take the dog to the dog park. That sounds amazing. What show are you currently streaming right now? Oh boy, let's see. We just finished, oh, I just uh, uh, finished the uh, uh, Suits. Oh, yeah. Meghan Markle, love it. Okay. Meghan Markle. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Lunch with anyone dead or alive? <clears throat> um, I'd love to have lunch with Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, what, do you do to, what do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Um, I actually watch cable news or read a book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm relaxing, but I, I sort of think it is. What's one leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? It was impressed on me in a number of ways that I'll put this in the negative just to be provocative. People don't give a damn what I have to say. People don't really care. I'm overstating that to make the, that's freedom because suddenly all the neurotic fears I'd had in my younger days of people watching me all the time turned out not to be true. They weren't watching me all the time. They actually don't care. And I found that actually kind of freeing, you know? Oh, I, I don't have to be slave to what I think other people's perceptions of me might be. It gets lost in the mirrors. I can just be me. Yeah, um, they have so much of their own drama going on. You're not that right. special, which is like a relief. It's like, oh, I thought yeah. it was so important. And it seems like, so maybe that stupid thing that I said, nobody actually heard it. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> um, and what is the best band or type of music of all time? <laughs> Strictly subjective, personal. I'm an old style Grateful Deadhead. Nice. Awesome. I first saw him in 1969 and just blew my mind and has ever since. What's your favorite type of vacation? Um, I, I, if you could somehow combine an interesting urban environment with time off at the beach, I mean, like, you know, Rio de Janeiro is fascinating because you, you got a vibrant city there, but you're, you know, just blocks, for, if, if that much, from, from a beach. Um, I've always loved those, too. Yeah, because you've probably traveled all over the world. How many countries have you been to? No idea. You know, basically, two I, I've not been to Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm, I've not been to uh, Russia, but South America, Czech, Europe, Czech, 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 Czech. Japan, China, Thailand. So yeah, I've, I've been able to get around. That's wonderful. And the last question is, if you could summarize your life in one quick motto, your outlook in one quick motto, what would that be? <laughs> I, I would say get over yourself. Get over your damn self. Yes. You know, uh, it's one of the best things you can do is focus on other people, not on yourself. And once you do that, uh, it turns out that things go much easier for you as well. You know, you end up winning anyway in your earlier parlance there. So yeah, yeah focus on others. Wonderful. Well, this has been so fun. I'd love to have breakfast with you again sometime again. If we're in the same place. Right. And I hope you'll come back and join us next time to talk more about these issues that are always relevant. This idea of building trust never goes away. Right. Absolutely agree. But it's been great, Blake. Thank you so much for having me on. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Everybody, you've been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Mm -hmm.